Good evening everybody, welcome to this evening episode of Pursue and this is Pursue 12O Respiratory Pathology and we are streaming live from UHS Southampton UK via Kolkata. We have a very special person to speak on the topic and a very special person to moderate. I would like to introduce the moderator. The moderator is Dr. Amanjit Bal, she is an MBBS MD DNB. Presently she is a professor in the Department of Histopathology PGI MER Chandigarh. She also has a Master's in Molecular Pathology and Genomics from Bart's Cancer Institute, London. With her interest in lung pathology, breast and lymphoma, with more than 250 publications in international and national peer-reviewed journals, she also was awarded the Commonwealth Scholarship, the VR Kon Konarkar Award, and also the Dr. Reddy's Lung Oration of ISSLC 2018. So I would request Dr. Amanjit Pal, ma'am, please take over and introduce the speaker and the topic and moderate the session from here, right? Uh, thank you, Dr. Nadeem, for these kind words and good evening all. So it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Sanjay, who is not a new face to you because you have already heard him twice in the past two months. He is an alumnus of PGMR Chandigarh. He joined his junior residency in 1996 and uh, did a part of his senior residency. Uh, in PGI only. After that, he joined uh, as a consultant histopathologist uh, in University Hospital Southampton, UK. His areas of interest are thoracic, lymphoreticular, head and neck pathology and autopsy pathology. And he has a lot of non-academic interests also, so which I won't talk about here. So uh, it's a privilege uh, to hear to you, Dr. Sanjay, on overview of mediastinal pathology, case-based approach. Over to you, Dr. Sanjay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Aman, for those kind words. And uh, Dr. Nadeem for giving me this opportunity. It's a pleasure and privilege. Just press present now, yeah. 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 Uh, please confirm once you see Dr. Nadeem. Yeah, fine. Absolutely perfect. perfect. Please start. Please. Okay. So, uh, good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, and I'll be starting a case based seminar on media spinal pathology. So, a bit about the outline. So, I'm not talking too much on theory, theoretical aspects of media spinal pathology. There are so many good textbooks about it. So these are all cases from my routine practice. Obviously, I can't include all examples because of uh, brevity of time. Uh, what I would like to emphasize is when we talk about media spinal pathology in general, where the lesion is arising, the age, the gender of the patient, these are very important aspects. So for example, you have a 10-year-old boy presenting with a superior vena cave obstruction. You'll straight away be thinking, is this a lymphoblastic lymphoma? Or a young woman with an anterior mediastinal mass, your differentials could be, is it Hodgkin lymphoma or a primary mediastinal basal lymphoma and so on and so forth. So I'll focus on morphology and elucidate the role of immunistic chemistry in these cases. This is a very nice diagram. Uh, this is from Rosanne Ackerman's Surgical Pathology. All of us are very familiar with this book. It basically encompasses almost everything that we see in mediastinum, more or less. So, within the superior and the anterior mediastinum, we tend to see thymic lesions. We can see lymphomas, thyroid pathology, which is, an, which is having a retrosternal component, germ cell tumors, paraganglioma,s and other soft tissue tumors. Posterior mediastinum, almost always, you tend to see more of either the cysts or the neurogenic tumors, and middle is a combination of cysts and malignant lymphomas. So, I all, all, often emphasize this to the trainees that where the lesion is coming from, the location of the lesion based on CT scan or other imaging modalities is very crucial, as well as the age, as I have just mentioned. So, what we'll do is we'll start with thymus, thymic tumors. Uh, approximately 25% of my talk would cons 
uh, contain a uh, description of various thymomas and a few pitfalls in immunistic chemical findings. So very briefly about the 2015 classification, you have the type A thymoma, then you have type AB, B1 to B3, and then you have thymic carcinoma with various subtypes. Now, in type A thymoma, you typically tend to see bland, spindle-shaped cells. Uh, there are very few lymphocytes in the tumor. That's a very important uh, clue to the diagnosis. There is another entity known as atypical type A thymoma, which can show hypercellularity, slight increase in mitosis or necrosis. Uh, so that is something to bear in mind. Now, the, with the thymic examples, I have not given too much detail as far as history is concerned, uh, except in a few cases. So for example, in this one, all I have got for you is an interior mediastinal mass in a 65-year-old male. So this is a scanner view, and as you can see, uh, there are multiple nodules. Uh, most of them are sort of encapsulated, well circumscribed, but freely going into the fat as well. On a high power, you can see that it is predominantly comprised of these short fascicles and whorls of pale-looking cells. Now let's look at these on a slightly higher a, 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 pic, a magnification you can see these very spindly cells and this is one focus where it's almost forming sort of tiny glands microglandular formations now on a high power you can see the spindly cells in whorls short intersecting fascicle with these fibrous bands and just to re-emphasize there are very few lymphocytes in the background so it's predominantly a spindle cell thymoma previously used to type a used to be called the spindle cell thymoma so this is a typical example of a type a thymoma now type a b thymoma one tends to see bland spindle shaped cells at least focally but lots of tdt positive t cells mainly largely in the tumor they can be focal but they are usually throughout the tumor now this isn't an example from a 63 year old lady and this is a scanner view now one of the things about thy uh, thymic pathology is when we are doing the cut up for example if this is for the trainees who, who might be viewing these sections later on it's very important that you ink the specimen on the outside because this, one of the important things the oncologist is going to ask you at the MDT is, are the resection margins positive? Because if resection margins are positive, they often tend to give them post-op radiotherapy. Plus, you can also assess capsular invasion. Now, in this particular example, you can see there are very dark blue areas, and then there are slightly paler areas, quite intimately admixed with that. And there is this another focus, which is quite pale blue. Now, let's go on a high power. You can see almost two different morphological patterns. In this area, you have those spindly cells, slightly pale, and you have a very lymphocyte-rich component in this area. Now, this is slightly high power from the main tumor, where the spindle-shaped cells are intimately blending with the dark and hyperchromatic appearing areas, which are basically lymphocyte-rich areas. Now, this is on a high power to show you the spindle cells and the lymphocyte rich areas. Uh, this is another focus which is almost exclusively spindle cells. So you can see there are very few lymphocytes in an area like this. If you saw this in exclusivity, you would call it a type A thymoma, but we clearly have a B component as well. Uh, this is slightly higher to show you the spindle cell areas. They, they don't show much nuclear pleomorphism. You barely see any mitotic activity. There is no necrosis. This is a very lymphocyte rich area. So you we basically are seeing a combination of type A and type B areas in this case. So it's a type AB thymoma. So this is one of the more common types of thymoma that I encounter in my routine practice compared to the other thymomas. So most of the times it's type AB thymoma. Now we come to type B thymomas. So starting with type B1, for example, type B1 thymoma basically mimics the thymic architecture. So we see a lot of immature T cells, but we have areas of medullary differentiation or medullary islands. We don't see many polygonal or dendritic epithelial cells. Now this is an example from a 60 year old male who had a history of myasthenia gravis as well. Now this is a scanner view. Again, to emphasize the point I made earlier, look at that island of tumor. 
it's invaded to, through this thick capsule, it's in this extra sort of capsular fat and again there is a tumor nodule here as well. So clearly an invasive type of thymoma which is almost abutting the resection margin. And you can see even on a scanner it's very blue. And another thing about this case is this is how thymomas typically look like. You see these thick fibrous bands separating these cellular nodules. So when we see on a scanner the first differential that should come to our mind is a thymic tumor. And on a high power, you see a sea of lymphocytes, large sheets of lymphocytes with these pale areas in between, which was which are basically the thymic epithelial cells. On h &E alone, they are quite difficult to spot, actually. Uh, you go on a high power and you see these slightly paler looking cells in between these ink dot nuclei, which are the lymphocytes. Those are the thymic epithelial cells. In a situation like this, immunohistochemistry is very helpful. For example, this is, this is a MNF1116, a cytokeratin, and you can see this very beautiful net-like pattern of the epithelial cells highlighted by the stain. And if you do a TDT, it will basically show a rich population of lymphocytes. Now, a word of caution here. Sometimes we will come across a core biopsy and in a core biopsy you can imagine if the core biopsy is taken from an area like this and you do uh, markers and you see that these are all CD3 positive cells and then you end up doing TDT and you see that they are all TDT positive cells. That's a particular pitfall for a diagnosis of the lymphoblastic lymphoma and we have seen this occurring in our referral practice. So it's very important to put the age into perspective and just throwing in an epithelial marker, for example an AE13 or MNF116 and you will see as I showed in the previous slide, this rich filigree pattern of MNF116 staining in that core, which will clinch the diagnosis and a potential misdiagnosis can be avoided because if a diagnosis of T lymphoblastic lymphoma is offered, the patient will be receiving chemotherapy, whereas a thymoma obviously will have a surgical management. So this is a type B1 thymoma. Case four. So I'm now digressing into slightly more uh, malignant and invasive uh, pathologies. So this was a 45-year-old lady with an interior mediastinal mass. There's very striking clinical history that this mass was invading into the surrounding structures like the pericardium, the vessels. Uh, I've specifically included this that there was no lung mass. Now, on a scanner itself, we can see that there is fatty tissue surrounding soft tissue and there are these tumor nodules which are freely sort of pushing and bulging into this tissue and if we go on a high power clearly they are very worrying looking I'll, I'll show you more pictures where it very discoisive solid sheets with a lot of desmoplastic stromal response now on a high power the cytology clearly is worrying you can see large nuclei uh, nucleoli are prominent, there is variation in size and shape of the nuclei and look at that. So you have got nuclear pleomorphism with prominent nucleoli. So clearly it's a very malignant looking process. Now this is in the thymic context, context a thymic squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, we can have a variety of carcinomas in the thymus. Common ones we see are keratinizing and non-keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma, but there are other variants which I el elucidated in the second or third slide. So the important thing here, I'll show you a case which was a particular pitfall from my practice in a minute. Now, this is another example of a particular variant. Uh, this is from seven, eight years ago. So this lady was 63 years old and she presented with this particular neurological problem, opsoclonus, myoclonus. Uh, typically, it is associated with small cell lung cancer. And on a CT scan, there was a nodule within the right anterior mediastinum. Now, the clinician said, could this be a thymoma? And was there a link between this and the opsoclonus, myoclonus by any chance? Uh, intraoperatively, they found a 20 millimeter nodule, which was overlying the pericardium, anterior to the right phrenic nerve. And this is how it looked. Now on a scanner, you can see slightly demarcated, very thin capsule. It's almost abutting the margins here. And very blue looking tumor, anastomosing islands with dark areas in between. And what are those? 
So we can clearly see this almost syncytial pattern of tumor with intervening lymphoid component, which are lymphoid follicles, actually some of them. And let's look at the morphology on a high power. Very vesicular nu looking nuclei with cherry red nucleoli. It doesn't project very well, unfortunately, for some reason on this slide, but they are very eosinophilic nucleoli. Now, if you saw this, something like this in the nasopharynx, you have got only one diagnosis. Is this a nasopharyngeal carcinoma or a lymphoepithelioma-like carcinoma? This is the first time I had actually seen this, opening up the books and you get an answer very soon what it is. So again, another high power to show this syncytial pattern of tumor with lots of lymphocytes in the background. Now, a few words about immunistic chemistry in a situation like this. So this is CD5, all those epithelial cells. So as we know, CD5 is actually a T-cell marker, but thymic carcinomas in particular show CD5 positivity. And the other marker of very, very, very useful in this scenario is CD117. So this particular tumor was both CD5 and CD117 positive. Taken together with that morphology, this is a particular variant, which is the lymphoepithelial carcinoma. or the or It is thymus, so there's nothing to do with the nasopharyngeal carcinoma as such, but morphologically, it looks similar. A few quick words about lymphoepithelial carcinoma. So it's identical to nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Approximately 50% of cases may show association with EBV. EBV is frequently positive in children and adults, young adults, whereas it's less common in more than 30 years of age. Uh, the association is not of prognostic significance. Patients with this tumor may be asymptomatic actually and may be detected only at imaging. There is no association with myasthenia or paraneoplastic syndrome. So the question that the surgeon asked us, opsoclonus, myoclonus, clearly it was not related to this. Unfortunately, they have poor prognosis. Now, at this stage, I would like to share a case with you from about four or five years and and show you how, how we can be sort of misled sometimes uh, in routine practice. This is absolutely real life example. This is how things happened. This is without any, any, uh, I've not made up anything at all. So this was a 51 year old helicopter pilot who presented with progressive shortness of breath and weight loss. The CT scan showed a mediastinal lymph node enlargement. Uh, they sent us a, they, they couldn't do a core biopsy, so they thought, let's take him to the theater and do a frozen section. And the question was, is this lymphoma or is this something else? Now, this is how the frozen section looked like. So you can see a uh, dense eosinophilic stroma in the background and you have got very crushed looking cells. You can't make out the morphology very well. Could be this, could this be small cell? Maybe. But then you come across areas like this where you can clearly see there's lots of cytoplasm and it the most closely it mimics is an, almost like a squamous pearl there, for example, keratin. So I thought this was probably a squamous cell carcinoma. So this is exactly what happened between the surgeon and myself on the telephone. So I said, can you tell me more? He said, okay, it's in the anterior mediastinum. So because I saw that sort of features, I said, could this be a thymic mass? And the surgeon said, yes, it could be. I said, oh, just to make sure you're not dealing with anything in the lung here, are you? Because this could be a lung metastasis. But he said, no, 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 lungs are absolutely fine, absolutely isolated anterior mediastinal mass. Now you take that into consideration and I said, okay, this could be a thymic carcinoma from the, uh, this could be a squamous cell carcinoma rising from the thymus, but I'll stop there. The important thing from your point of view, it's not small cell, it's not lymphoma morphology. Let's wait for immunistic chemistry and then we take it from there. And the surgeon closed the patient and I came back to the lab. Now, this is what I went ahead because in my mind, I thought, Putting everything together, this should be a thymic squamous cell carcinoma. And look at this. You, you won't disagree with me at all when I say strongly CD5 and CD117 positive. Almost similar in pattern of staining to the lymphoepithelial carcinoma we saw a few minutes ago. And strongly P63 positive as well. So I put everything together. So this is a squamous cell carcinoma. It's expressing 5 and 117. Clinically, you are telling me this is from the thymus. Imaging-wise, there is nothing in the lungs. This could be a thymic squamous cell carcinoma. Full stop, went back. Few weeks passed by. 
then the oncologist comes back says sanjay this is not looking like thy thymic carcinoma we have done a ct pet after the frozen section and while you have been doing your immunohistochemistry chemistry and the patient has got multiple metastases to the bone pleura abdominal nodes and liver that's very odd and most importantly they found the perihilar region on the right side and the bronchus intermedius with marked degree of pet activity so taking in that into consideration this was actually a metastatic squamous cell carcinoma of pulmonary origin that is masqueraded as a thymic carcinoma so going back to the dictum that mere immunohistochemistry chemistry analysis in this case would have called a diagnosis of a thymic squamous cell carcinoma but clearly with progression with follow up this was actually a lung cancer so we should always remember about the interpretation of immunohistochemistry chemistry in the right clinical context so just a couple of seconds for practical issues so when we come across mediastinal mass core biopsies th th these are problematic areas in day to day practice so common things being common if it's epithelial we should always exclude is something coming from the lung for example this case illustrates to us that although at presentation there was nothing in the lungs it was clinically no no other primary known it was an anterior mediastinal mass but clearly later on it evolved and ihc itself is not the no all and be all phenomena so we have to put everything together and close clinical radiological and pathological correlation is very important now one may ask oh hang on it's a metastasis it's a metastasis i i i thought what's the take of the oncologist then the oncologist said hang on primary thymic cancer carcinoma with metastasis from somewhere else the chemotherapy regimen is completely different so we will take that with a pinch of salt so we would want to know as far as possible what the accurate site of the origin of the tumor is now a couple of slides to just illustrate a few practice points mainly probably for the trainees if they are viewing these slides later so type b1 and b2 thymomas are by definition both lymphocyte rich tumors they maintain thymus like architecture and cytology in b1 thymomas b2 thymomas of course show more number of polygonal epithelial cells b3 is a very lymphocyte poor thymoma i'm afraid i didn't have an example of hand to click pictures otherwise i would have shown you and a good clue is b2 thymomas often look very blue on hnd staining because there are so many lymphocytes b3 thymomas often look pink because they are mainly epithelial with not many uh, uh, lymphocytes in the background this is an important thing so this is from the uh, recent guidelines that have come out so sometimes we will come across situations where it's diffi difficult to distinguish b3 from a thymic squam and the dictum then is if a tumor with b3 thymoma morphology shows focal expression of cd5 or 117 or shows lack of tdt positive t cells the important thing is if on hnd the tumor looks more like type b3 thymomas one should favor that whereas if it's clearly looking like a thymic squam it should be favored as a thymic squamous cell carcinoma so if we go back to the first ex uh, second or third example which i showed in the young lady with an invasive tumor there was no doubt in our minds that that was an invasive squamous cell carcinoma so in a case like this we wouldn't think of uh, thymomas i'll i'll just go back for a few uh, slides just to recapitulate where which case i'm talking about so for example this one so with this sort of morphology we wouldn't think of a type b3 thymoma at all because it's clearly very invasive cytologically it is malignant it looks like a squamous cell carcinoma rising anywhere else okay so let's go back and yeah this is one of the uh, sort of uh, in the last 5 6 years this has come up when we are reporting thymomas in surgical pathology unless this is a type ab thymoma the other thymomas we should give a components so for example we would say 70% b1 20% b2 10% b3 it's important to give those components almost similar to how we report lung pathology and what has happened in the last 5 10 years or so or maybe a bit longer that we don't call them benign tumors at all because 
almost all major thymoma subtypes clinically behave aggressively and they should not be called benign. So this is the TNM 8th edition about the staging. I think I'll, I'll skip this in the interest of time because this should be freely available in most, most of the textbooks. So at this point, I'll take a pause. If there were any questions, Dr. Aman, from anyone, I'll be happy to entertain. Yeah, thank you, Sanjay. So there are a lot of, I mean, key point, key learning points here, especially CD5 and uh, CD117 positivity, because we rely too much on these two markers for differentiated primary thymic versus metastasis from lung, you know, for squamous cell carcinomas. So I think it's more of a clinical correlation is a must. But even, you know, sometimes clinicians are not very sure the mass is mediastinal or it's going into the lung or from lung it is coming to the mediastinum. Exactly, exactly. That is the biggest problem. I remember in, in I think it was 2013 at the Pulmonary Pathology Society meeting in uh, uh, Grenoble in France and Anya Rodin from Mayo Clinic was presenting thymic tumors and I ended up asking after the presentation, how do you distinguish on core biopsies if you see a squamous cell carcinoma from a primary thymic? And she said the same thing as you are saying, Aman, that it's, it's, it's entirely clinical pathological and that case, I'll never forget that case of that pilot. I mean, he's since died, unfortunately, where it was so... I, could, I was so persuaded by that CD5 and CD117 and because there was nothing in the lung. But yeah. in the course of events, it transpired that it was lung. So I always think as the professors in PGA used to teach us common things being common. Uh, yeah, thank Agreed. you. So we have two questions. One is from Dr. Bala Morgan. He said uh, TDT positivity on core biopsy. So LBL versus type B1 thymoma, how does CK pattern of CK positivity helps? Yeah, so a very good question. So if you do a cytokeratin, the very fact that you are seeing epithelial cell positivity in a core biopsy in a background of TDT should absolutely clinch the diagnosis because in a pure lymphoblastic lymphoma, that is very, very uncommon to see. Second thing is you would, as I said at the first or second slide, the age of the patient when it comes to thymomas, you would not see in, in that age group where you are thinking of a differential between a lymphoblastic lymphoma and a thym thymoma. So once you see epithelial marker positivity, you are going for a thymoma. Right. So Dr. Pulkit says, post-chemotherapy thymic hyperplasia, is it also a pitfall? So uh, chemotherapy for lymphomas, I think he meant, and that leads to thymic hyperplasia. So I think he has, so we had one case which was causing a lot of confusion, a patient of lymphoblastic lymphoma post-chemotherapy, he presents with this thymic hyperplasia. I, I, I must com completely confess, I haven't had any experience of that, Dr. Dr. Aman and Dr. Pulkit, so I, I don't think I'll have the right answer. Okay, so should we use squamoid thymoma term in reporting by Dr. Manish Gandhi? Squamoid thymoma? Yeah. Oh, I, I, I must say, I haven't come across this squamoid thymoma. Uh, no. I, I think with this term is not used. So you uh, subtype thymomas or you say uh, squamous cell carcinoma arising in a thymus, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So if, if we can locate the site as thymic, then I would say thymic squamous cell carcinoma, then subtype it, keratinizing, non-keratinizing, basaloid, lymphoepithelial, mucopetermoid, then give the subvariant. But I, I must say, I mean, we see a lot of thymomas, but thymic carcinomas we don't see very often. How is your experience, Dr. Aman? No, extremely rare. And moreover, we have more of a B1 and B2 thymomas, and we don't find AB more frequently. As you said, you see more AB in your practice. Practice. Do so you see you more resections, Dr. Raman, or do you see more core biopsies? Uh, core biopsies and few resections. Okay. Because, yeah. And uh, yeah. Dr. Manesh has again asked, if no capsular invasion, does B1, B3 behave differently biologically? Yes, yes, good point. B3 is slightly worse than B1. That is one of the reasons why the WHO also came up with this subcategorization of 
giving the percentage so b3 behaves more aggressively than b1 that's the whole point of distinguishing b3 from thymic squam as well so yeah b1 is much better it's it's almost resembling or recapitulating thymus but ultimately invasion and margins are the single most important features that the oncologist would be asking yeah agreed dr bala again coming back to can native thymic epithelial cells come in lymphoblastic lymphoma core biopsy <laughs> uh, anecdotally yes uh, but i think what i would do dr bala is i would go back to the clinical and the imaging and as pathologist if we if we do that i, I think we can come to a diagnosis in a better way because mere presence of epithelial islands ruling out a lymphoblastic lymphoma or a thymoma just mere with that would probably be difficult so i i would give importance to clinical as well yeah okay so i think we don't have my uh, other questions about this so we can go okay. ahead yeah okay thank you thank you dr aman let's carry on now uh, with that i will come to the lymphomas of the mediastinum now uh, the list is exhaustive there are so many different kinds of lymphomas but what i thought to do was rather than discussing so many different varieties just pick up a few cases from routine practice share with you those and give you the Uh, an immunist chemical sort of background to those cases so uh, i'll be discussing only the first four examples so pmbl hodgkin malt and t lymphoblastic i don't have an example of the unclassifiable variant i'm sorry so uh, this was a 35 year old lady she had an anterior mediastinal mass there was nothing else on scan and i emphasize that because it's very important from uh, from uh, for making the appropriate diagnosis in this case now these were very good size core biopsies this is a scanner view as you can see very cellular looking cores and this is on a high power now what I, i would like to pause for half a minute or so and emphasize for the trainees especially this is a very important feature in the diagnosis of this particular type of lymphoma so what you are seeing are these very delicate and cellular fibrous bands that are separating these cellular nodules the who books book uses the a particular word compartmentalizing fibrosis or alveolar pattern fibrosis this is in contrast to the type of fibrosis we see in nodular sclerosis hodgkin lymphoma so the, for the trainees this is very important when on a scanner in a core biopsy you see this type of cellular fibrosis in a young woman anterior mediastinum you are basically dealing with one entity only almost now this is another view to show you those spindly shaped cells delicate cytoplasm almost like an alveolar architecture solid sheets as well now let's look at the morphology so clearly these are medium to large cells with lots of cytoplasm and very diffuse sheet like we don't see any hodgkin type cells at all this is another area another focus to show you medium to large size cells nuclear irregularities and then we come to the immunistic chemistry so this is beautiful cd20 which shows you the nodularity of this infiltrate and look at those fibrous bands separating them they're clearly negative all over cd20 positive now i have i have not clicked pictures for each and every immuno stain but just showing you the salient ones this is cd23 now this is a very useful stain for this particular diagnosis almost most of the cells are showing very strong cd23 positivity this is mum1 so it's an activated b cell type phenotype and this is a k67 so clearly it's a high grade b cell lymphoma expressing cd20 showing compartmentalizing fibrosis high k67 and cd23 expression so what we are dealing with is a primary mediastinal or a thymic large b cell lymphoma now a very brief uh, few words about pmbcl uh, usually young adults most of the cases in my practice i have seen have been females rather than more than 2 is to 1 i think i i can't remember the last time i saw a pmbl in a young man entero superior mediastinal mass is is where this is located it frequently invades the adjacent structures now one very important point about the diagnosis if we see that there is disease elsewhere like nodal involvement or above the below the diaphragm or bone marrow involvement 
this is DLBCL systemic type which is involving the mediastinum. We don't easily make the diagnosis of PMBL because that's a completely different entity. So when we are offering this diagnosis, obviously the histological features would be typical. It's always important to go back to the clinical. Now one may ask, could PMBL not advance? Yes, it can. But the predominant disease and the gender and the localization is very important in diagnosis. CD30 is another very good marker. It's positive in more than 80% cases. But what's different between CD30 staining here and, for example, in anaplastic large cell or Hodgkin is the pattern of staining is very weak and heterogeneous. Like you'll see some stain cells which are strongly positive, others which have a bit of a sort of wishy-washy stain. You're wondering is it positive or not, that sort of thing. CD23 is very important. So up to 70% cases are CD23 positive. So when you see this, this combination of findings taking together the clinical information, you can arrive at that diagnosis. Now, I'm contrasting that case with this one. Uh, this is from recent, uh, uh, recent files. So 22-year-old lady, uh, anterior mediastinal mass. Unfortunately, she had a core biopsy which, was, which just showed fibrous tissue. So the surgeon said, oh, we don't want to be subjecting this patient to so much of trouble. Can we do a frozen section? Just tell us if it is adequate and we'll stop. So they sent us a frozen section. Now, this is how the frozen section looked like. So it was, it was pink blue, but there was lots of good chunks of tissue. Now, all I could say was, it is probably a lymphoma on frozen section. Uh, so the important thing was the surgeon asking, are you satisfied with the material we have sent? I said, yes. Can you make a diagnosis on paraffin? I said, yes. And we'll stop there. I must be honest. I didn't go ahead and make a definitive diagnosis of what type of lymphoma this was. It did look lymphoma. I said, it doesn't look like an epithelial malignancy. She's 22. Stop. Let's wait. Now, you can see this particular case, actually. There's a lot of crush artifact, which makes it quite tricky. So there are these fibrous bands. And then there are these cellular nodules. Now, Going straight away on to a high power, you can see scattered eosinophils, eosinophils in the background. Some of them are have degranulated. And then you see these slightly larger cells with histiocytes, small lymphocytes, and plasma cells. Now, with sort of careful looking, maybe a few cells which could just fit in with lacuna cells. But that's about it. Now, the beauty of cases like this is how gratifying the immunistochemistry can be. Because taking together everything, you're thinking of one diagnosis here. You're thinking of, is this nodal sclerosis Hodgkin lymphoma? It's clearly not a PMBCL because those sclerotic bands and the cellular components are completely different. This is CD30. And for the trainees, it's, it's very nice to see this perinuclear Golgi region dot positivity of CD30. Very, very interesting. If, if you see this, you are home and dry. And this is CD15. Again, very nice and strong positivity. Of, often you see CD15 maybe less, less intense than CD30, but that's fine. What I often tell my trainees is when you are looking at a CD15 slide, always go on a high power hunting for cells because sometimes you may see very weak, faint granular positivity in occasional cells, but that should still be taken into account. Obviously, these are LCA negative. Now, Quick word about PAX-5 or BSAP. It's a B-cell marker, but what happens in Hodgkin lymphoma is the intensity of staining is slightly a tone dimmer than the strong positivity we see with B-cells. And that's a very useful clue, especially when we are dealing with core biopsies and we are wondering, is this Hodgkin or not? And you are having a slender core, you are running out of tissue. LCA negativity with PAX-5 positivity of this type with a 30 and 15, you can clinch the diagnosis. So this is basically classic Hodgkin lymphoma nodular sclerosis subtype. Quickly, to show you another example, just to give you a contrast of how within a couple of weeks you can have cases which are so floridly different. So this is from more recent, like the week before last, 20-year-old male, anterior mediastinal mass. Clinically, they said, this is lymphoma, but tell us what type of lymphoma this is. Very cellular, nice, chunky fragments. There is no crush artifact or anything compared to the previous case. And again, Look at those sclerotic bands at the edges. And here we are spoiled for choices. You've got so many cells, those convoluted nuclei, some binucleate, multinucleate cells. And look at the beautiful immunistic chemistry pattern. So this is a CD30. 
almost every single Hodgkin cell has been highlighted by CD30. And look at the CD15 as well. This is showing the perinuclear dot-like positivity as well. So with this sort of morphology, this immunistic chemistry, you, you are home and dry. And it's, it's, it's another example of classic Hodgkin lymphoma. With that, we will just digress a bit because this is a 73-year-old male and the imaging and clinical diagnosis was of a thymoma. And I, I, I must admit, this is the only example I've seen in an error section. So this is a scanner view and there are a few points which I would like to bring up here. So if we remember all the thymoma examples that we have seen, those were lobulated masses separated by fibrous bands, very sharp delineation. But what's happening here, you can clearly see fatty tissue at the edges infiltrated by those blue cells. There's no clear demarcation. There's, there are a bit of fibrous bands here and there, but clearly something else is going on. So is this, is this actually a thymoma? So we go on a high power. So you see these slightly paler areas and then the dark looking lymphoid cells and clearly infiltrating the surrounding fat. On a high power, the things start to get a bit easier. Those are not thymic epithelial cells. Those are atypical lymphoid cells, which are so closely admixed. And on a high power, you can see that the chromatin pattern is slightly opened up. And you do a CD20. I was, I, I mean, I was very excited because this is the first, first example I was seeing in an excision because if this was a core biopsy, this would not come to an excision. But the patient didn't have a core biopsy, had presented as a thymic mass, elderly patient, so the diagnosis was thymoma. And it was so surprising that it was strongly CD20 positive. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is a beautiful stain here. This is an MNF116. And what it highlights is, nicely brings up the thymic epithelium. So you can actually see and pinpoint that this lymphoma is arising from within the thymus. And then you see the other stains, BCL6 basically picking up the residual germinal centers. CD10 is largely negative. And K67, overall low, just picking up the germinal centers. And that is the clincher. So that's a kappa, which is showing pale, maybe some plasma cells, but otherwise negative. And look at that lambda. It's strongly positive. So this is an extra nodal marginal zone lymphoma of the thymus on a resection specimen, which I found was very unusual because had this patient had a core biopsy, we would have got the diagnosis, but the surgeons and the clinicians were con convinced that in an elderly man, this was an anterior mediastinal mass and likely to be a thymoma. So very nice example, the, the only example of resection I've seen. With that, we take a slight twist uh, that we are dealing with a 12-year-old boy. And often, I'm sure as pathologists, we would have come across this situation when things become urgent, you know, Burkitt or lymphoblastic and this sort of thing. So this was a biopsy that landed up on a Thursday evening. Now, we don't tend to work on a Saturday and Sunday here, fortunately. It's a weekend. And the oncologist was banging on, can we have an h &E diagnosis by Friday end, Friday close of play, and we can treat the patient? So there was a lot of rush. Obviously, it's a core biopsy. A very blue-looking core in a 10-year-old. So going back to Dr. Bala's question, uh, let's let's deal with this case. So I think it's, it's not the best section in the world. It's quite thickly cut, so the morphology is a bit difficult, but you can see a very diffuse infiltrate. So I've chosen an area where the cells are a bit more dispersed. Look at the chromatin pattern medium size, small to medium size, rounded cells with very smudged looking chromatin. Another area. Obviously, again, if we just look at this in a completely different context, are you thinking of a small cell? But hey, ho, we are dealing with a 12 year old here. And this is CD20, completely negative. And this is CD3, absolutely strong king, strongly positive. And this is CD79A. Now for the trainees, I, I'm sure most of them are aware. So CD79A is a B cell marker, but in lymphoblastic lymphomas, even in T lymphoblastic lymphomas, you can see CD79 expression. It's usually not positive in every single cell compared to CD3, and you can see that there are negative areas in between. And this is CD10, often these are CD10 positive. And look at that TGT, that's absolutely clincher here. And that's the proliferation. So 
this was actually a T lymphoblastic lymphoma. So thankfully, before the close of play on a Friday, we were able to say that it looks blue. In the appropriate clinical context, this would be a T lymphoblastic. The oncologist was happy. He didn't wait for the immunos to come till Monday because nobody would do them on a Saturday. Went ahead, treated the patient on on Saturday and Sunday. And uh, so patient received the first cycle. And on Monday, we did the immunos. Tuesday, we told, yeah, it is T lymphoblastic. So with that, I think I'll take a pause for any questions on lymphomas. Okay, so uh, nice cases, Dr. Sanjay. So I just wanted to ask, uh, sorry, uh, primary mediastinal B-cell lymphoma, if it recurs yes. uh, outside, like it uh, shows infiltration in kidney, does it show yep. all the immunohistochemical features which we see in thymus at the extra thymic site also? Usually, yes, it's a very good point because from time to time when recurrence patients come back, see, somehow I've seen CD23 and CD30 retention in a similar way. Right. So, okay. yeah, even in extra mediastinal sites, for some reason, it retains its original uh, immunohistochemical profile. But yeah, that's a valid even point. the morphology also, right? That's yeah, yeah, morphology, yeah, yeah, your point is very valid. In a nodal site it will probably not show as good compartmentalizing fibrosis as you see in the thymus. That bit of morphology is mainly restricted to the thymus. So then it will be on immunophenotype that you have an activated B cell type, which will be MUM1 positive with strong CD23 and heterogeneous CD30. Now, obviously, the clinical history will be important that you have a background diagnosis of PMBCL and then you'll say that it's the same thing that is record. But yeah, that's a valid right. point. Okay. So, Dr. Pulkit wants, wants to ask whether hence classification is applied to uh, mediastinal B-cell lymphoma or not? Uh, good point, Dr. Pulkit. Uh, we tend to see that these are usually IRF MUM1 positive. So, they are non-GC type. But as, when it comes to bottom line, we are not saying it is non-GC or GC type. We just label it as PMBCL. So, accurately speaking, not. Uh, any experience with male IHC uh, for primary PTS renal B cell lymphomas? That's myelin and lymphocyte uh, protein. So studies no, have shown, no. I mean, to differentiate from systemic DLBCL versus primary mediastinal. I'm afraid not, Dr. Aman. No, please, uh, please educate us if you have. No, any... no, even, even we are not using. So literature okay. says that this is very helpful in differentiating primary mediastinal from systemic DLBCL, which is involving the mediastinal. Ah, okay. Yeah, good point. I, I, I feel uh, quite strongly that so many of the things can be sorted if we have access to patient records and a good communication with the oncologist. Most of the time I have the oncologist on the phone saying, Sanjay, this we think is this. I, I, I see most of the times they are right in the sense, not that I'm saying I'm blindly believing because the clinical picture is so striking with cases, with, with especially things like PMBL, almost always young women, almost always restricted site. Maybe it is because we are seeing early disease and for example, in India, patients may present with advanced disease and you are thinking, is it DLBCL with secondary mediastinal involvement or is it PMBCL which has gone? Maybe that is one thing. Right. Great. So, yeah. please share your experience on gray zone lymphomas on core biopsy. Oh, no. no I'm, I'm afraid. Minimal, minimal. No, uh, I don't think I will uh, I'll be able to uh, do more there. Uh, uh, when, when we come across situations like this, we, we sometimes tend to leave it a bit more open-ended, sometimes ask for a repeat biopsy, but uh, it's a very tricky area. Thankfully, there are not many cases in my practice, so I don't come across that very often. Sometimes in mediastinal Hodgkin's lymphomas, uh, you know, uh, the strong CD20 positivity in RSL sometimes causes confusion whether we are dealing with, uh, I mean, Hodgkin's or something more than that. So, I don't know how to deal with those cases. So, I think it's better to give a bottom line that it probably represents a gray zone, so should be treated accordingly. So, I think WHS still has those gray zone categories uh, intact. Yeah. Yeah, no, your point is valid. And we, we are five of us practicing here in Southampton. And sometimes we come across cases like that where three people are thinking A and two are thinking B. 
and then ultimately you are sort of wondering is this sometimes we struggle to be honest whether lca is actually positive or not yeah exactly. and it is documented that sometimes even hodgkin can show lca positivity so then you are latching up to pax5 is pax5 pattern as i showed slightly dimmer than the b cells so you, you, i i think at a, on a practical level you are absolutely right we 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 will come across situations like that where we are not absolutely sure and the best thing i think is evolution of the disease so in months to weeks or uh, like when the patient comes back again things become clearer sometimes right right exactly. yeah okay so we have no more questions and we can continue okay thank you dr aman so with sorry yeah so with that i'll move to germ cell tumors i don't have a, like a plethora of examples so i'll i'll be a bit restrictive but just a few words single most important thing when we are coming across germ cell tumor in the mediastinum is always to let the clinician know that they should examine the gonads is there a primary in the testes or the ovaries which is metastasizing to the mediastinum or is it actually mediastinal germ cell tumor that's very important all the varieties that we tend to see in the gonads we tend to see here as well the common ones we tend to see are seminomas teratomas yolk sac tumors mature teratomas actually represent a lot uh, of the non teratomas seminomas 40% non seminomatous tumors 60% 25% of all primary mediastinal tumors in children are germ cells 15% of all mediastinal tumors in adults are germ cells I have said that mature cystic teratoma is the most common, but I don't have a picture of it. I'm so sorry because my I I restricted my slide seminar to a bit more towards the slightly more difficult ones. Serum tumor markers are very helpful. So when you make a diagnosis, if you put a rider that okay, could this be correlated with the serum tumor markers? With that, I'll show you a few examples. So this was a 32 year old male with an anterior mediastinal mass, and clinically they did a core biopsy, thinking this was a lymphoma. and this is how the biopsy look like so you can see a lot of fibrous tissue in between and there is there are these blue areas but clearly they are forming some kind of structures rather than looking like sheets of lymphoma cells slightly on a high power and look at that absolutely striking these rounded sort of structures shell dual bodies and these nuclei which are hyperchromatic with scant to moderate amount of cytoplasm another area very nicely shown i always tell my trainees if you are seeing things like that always include in your armamentarium germ cell tumor markers now this is sal4 and you can see how nice and crisply stained the section is almost every single cell is positive this is mnf116 this is oct34 negative alpha fetoprotein negative plap is negative CD30 is negative, so we are dealing with a yolk sac tumor. Again, I I must uh, confess that we don't see many examples, so these are isolated examples from my files. Uh, quickly following that, another 41 year old with a mediastinal mass, and this was clinically either a lymphoma or a carcinoma, and this gave us some problems. And here I would like to share. with the trainees some of the problems we see in mediastinal pathology now if you look at this on a scanner you can see almost granuloma like structures isn't it you see these spindly shaped cells and look at that i mean spindly shaped cells ill formed granuloma some lymphocytes in the background so is it a non necrotizing granuloma it is inflammation look at that absolute like fairly to some extent even compact but when we look carefully there are these cells in the background slightly smudged nuclei they are clearly large in size and they are admixed with these background lymphocytes this is another focus look at that and there is this very delicate cytoplasm nuclear prominence and that should always worry you now like there were 20 30 immunos that were done on this case so i won't bore you with everything but i'll show you the pertinent ones so again this is a sal4 beautifully highlighting those cells this is cd117 this is mnf116 clearly negative cd30 is negative and plap 
is brilliantly bringing up all the cells. A lot of those are actually crushed cells. So on H and E, you can't even see that there were that many cells. But when you do immunos, all those cells get highlighted. So again, this is a seminoma, and the patient didn't have anything in the gonads and in the testes basically. So this is a primary mediastinal seminoma, and this can be such an important diagnosis for the oncologist. Straight away, they can go ahead and treat it as a seminoma. Now. This is from a few years ago, actually. So, 26-year-old male. Again, clinically, this was lymphoma, and very crushed-looking pink biopsy, and there are these smudged cells in the background. But here you can see they are large, with sort of fibrillary or sort of very wispy cytoplasm, delicate cytoplasm, and again, as I showed in the first case, slight sort of hint of. Is the granuloma formation? So going back to granulomas in core biopsy. So for the trainees, it's very important that you look at carefully: is there a cellular component in the background, and do appropriate immunistic chemistry rather than spending tissue for zeals and PAs and grocot. And look at this area again. There are clearly those very abnormal-looking cells, and. This is another granuloma. So granulomatous response in tumors is well known, very well known pitfall, and this is very nice. Plap, OCT34, CD117. So again, a nice example of mediastinal seminoma. So I think I'll skip uh, because it's very. It's the break has come on quite quickly, so we can go for a few more and then. So now we take a complete uh, sort of a different. Uh, The divergent route and go towards posterior mediastinum. Now, I don't have many immunos on these cases because a lot of them are based on morphology. So I will just talk about the immunos briefly. So this was a posterior mediastinal mass in a 43-year-old lady, and the clinician said, "Is this like a cyst? Because it was very fluctuant. What was the nature? He didn't know and just took it out." So this is a scanner view. You can see this thick cyst wall. The central bit is almost, almost like, almost infarcted. You can barely see any cellular structures, and that is an important thing. That when we have a case like this, always carefully look towards the edges. And here you can see sort of whorls and short fascicles with a lot of interstitial edema in between, and you have those spindly cells. You go on a slightly high power, and you see these very nice verruca bodies with these eosinophilic centers and palisaded by these spindle-shaped cells. Now this is good. So in the sense, you have these hyperchromatic large nuclei. Now to a beginner in pathology, if we apply the uh, criteria for nuclear pyomorphism, one can easily get worried. But that's a degenerative change in a schwannoma. One has to always keep in mind. So the take-home message for trainees is that if you don't see any mitoses, if you see this sort of degenerative change, don't get too worried. If you see mitoses, if there is a background of neurofibromatosis, always get worried because that may indicate malignant change. But in isolation, these are just degenerative changes. You, one often sees lot of hemosiderin-laden macrophages in the background, and a feature that I see almost always is this typical perivascular hyalinization in most schwannomas. So this is basically a schwannoma with degenerative change. Now somebody may. term it as ancient schwannoma chris fletcher i long ago remember reading he used to be very specific you use the word ancient schwannoma only when you can barely make out it's a schwannoma and it's s100 that clinches the diagnosis so i would be a bit more circumspect and i would just say it's a schwannoma with some degenerative change rather than an ancient schwannoma but i think it is semantics to some extent and then we go to a younger patient who was 14 years old and this was a posterior mediastinal mass very smooth and well circumscribed and on a slightly high power you can see these large cells with prominent big nuclei and prominent nucleoli with these smaller cells and then towards the periphery you have these spindly cells and again these large cells so these are the ganglion cells basically and you have this medium to small round sort of blue cells these are the neuroblastic cells and the sp spindle cells are the neuroma cells and again look at this triple chromatin pattern so putting everything together this is a ganglio neuroblastoma because we have got all three components sometimes we see we don't see the blastoma component and we just call it a ganglio neuroma uh, but again these are a very occasional examples that i've seen in my practice and 
then yeah this is from this week actually uh, i i i have still not completed the case fully so it's still on my desk for sign up this is a referral case and all i was told that this is a mediastinal mass in a 61 year old male and this is how the core biopsy looks like so very delicate vascular pattern and these spindly cells and you see this intervening sort of collagen which is quite keloidal very highly nice type and the cells are relatively monomorphic they don't show much atypia there is no mitosis there is no necrosis and again another power to show you the cellular details and this is beautiful so this is cd34 positive and cd99 positive and bcl2 positive so i'm just waiting for a stat 6 so this is an example of a solitary fibrous tumor now this is from several years ago this came as a retrosternal mass i remember and the clinician said was this a goiter and very nicely sort of circumscribed very cellular looking so you have got these va vascular rich vascular pattern perivascular ionization and very cellular tumor and there is some degree of cytologic atypia there were areas i i, I I'm afraid I should have sort of picked those areas up as well where there were mitotic figures and few areas of necrosis were also seen. So this is a solitary fibrous tumor as well. So in those days, we didn't have STAT-6. So it was 34 positive and this was solitary fibrous showing some atypia. It wasn't frankly malignant. Uh, so I had to do a slightly descriptive report saying there are a few worrying features, but it still does not qualify for malignant solitary fibrous tumor. So I left it slightly open-ended, but solitary fibrous tumor nevertheless and then we come to uh, uh, an 85 year old lady who had a mass in the mediastinum which was encasing and i was quite stunned when i saw the morphology of this case the reason i'm saying is they thought it was a lymphoma and when i saw this i thought is this a mix-up with some case i went back to the spot specimen pot block but it was matching because i was quite surprised when i saw so what the reason i was surprised was the thinking of a lymphoma and this looked a very very fatty looking tumor in an elderly woman which was encasing the structures and the morphology is so beautiful because you've got variation in cell size you have this multi-vacuolated cells look at that beautiful scalloping of the nuclei so these are lipoblasts and then you've got these hyperchromatic stromal cells as well in this stroma and a mix of inflammatory cells as well the tumor was mdm2 positive so this is an example of a liposarcoma very unusual uh, clinically and pathologically that I, I can't remember ever seeing a liposarcoma coming as an anterior mediastinal mass so the only example kept aside for teaching and then slightly more mundane sort of stuff this is a cystic lesion in a young woman and you can see a lot of sort of enucleated squames in a central cyst but what's interesting is there is smooth muscle in the wall and this foreign body type giant cell reaction to the squamoid uh, enucleated squames so this is a benign cyst in the appropriate cl clinical context this was consistent with a paraesophageal cyst now this is interesting in the sense it's a simple pathology but how a pathologist can make so much difference to the clinical management so this was a 50 year old male who presented with hyperparathyroidism they scanned the neck they couldn't find anything so they scanned the rest of the body and they said there was a well-defined nodule in the media stand i mean they said the, the question mark on this request card was could this be a parathyroid adenoma they were basically clutching straws where what is the cause for hypercalcemia in this patient and it's a straightforward diagnosis because it's just that the site is out. So we have got a very thinly encapsulated uh, sort of tumor nodule. And look at this beautiful micro follicles and solid cells of parathyroid chief cells. So in an, like if it is in the neck, we wouldn't even uh, like bat an eyelid before the diagnosis. But in the right clinical context, this was basically an ectopic parathyroid adenoma. We, we see this from time to time, but not very commonly okay so next is case number 22 a 32 year old lady uh, she had a big neck mass which was extend extending behind the sternum as well so we received like five or six part specimen with neck dissection everything but this is a retrosternal mass the reason i have included this case is from the trainee's point of view to think about this diagnosis uh, even in an uncommon site so a very cystic looking mass fatty tissue and look at that 
absolute beautiful papillae and on a high power it shows grooves nuclear overlapping clearing or orphan any nuclei one of those tumors in the body where, where, where the nuclear features are of such importance and a beautiful pseudo inclusion as well now because of the context and everything we did immunistic chemistry so ttf1 is positive so somebody may come up okay why couldn't it be a lung tumor with metastasis so one of the important things that one can be can do is a thyroglobulin so this is thyroglobulin and obviously there's a lot of background colloid that is staining but the cells are positive as well so that glitches the diagnosis so basically it's a papillary thyroid carcinoma it's a straightforward case but it's just that in the retrosternal area we need to remember we can get colloid goiter we can get ectopic parathyroid adenomas we can get metastatic papillary thyroid carcinoma so as trainees it's important to remember those differential diagnosis in the appropriate setting and that brings uh, me to my final case so this is from a few years ago 52 year old male mediastinal mass uh, they they had no idea what this was so there was a very wide differential and they sent these biopsies so this is a scanner view some fibrous sort of capsular tissue with a cellular tumor a bit of crush artifact making it difficult to analyze and then you have these sort of clusters of cells with this fibrous stroma uh that's the best i could get out of morphology so medium sized cells i would say with mild nuclear pleomorphism so i'll the reason i included this case was for was for the trainees to emphasize on the immunistic chemistry so this is cd34 i'll come to the clinching uh, immunistic chemistry towards the end and you can see how beautifully it's highlighting the vessels but the tumor cells are all negative this is ae13 an epithelial marker so the tumor cells are negative this is mnf116 another epithelial marker again negative this is hmb45 uh, i wish i had an example for a metastatic melanoma for the trainees but uh, i i couldn't find out one at the right time so when we are dealing with tumors where we can't think of morphology it's always good to add melanoma markers so this is hmb45 completely negative this is ttf1 so we have a mediastinal lesion we, it's always good to exclude so these were all done in the same panel and this is s100 and it's a beautiful stain because what it shows is these nice sustentacular cells around these clusters of tumor cells beautiful nuclear staining and this wispy cytoplasmic staining and that is the clincher of the diagnosis that it's highlighting these sort of cell ball and patterns or nesting pattern and this is chromogranin very strongly positive and this is synaptophysin this is so strong that you can barely see the cells and similarly cd56 is very strong and key 67 is very low so it's almost like less than 1 to 2% so this is actually mediastinal paraganglioma again on the only example i've seen as a resection specimen we see sometimes in core biopsies so that is it and i'm happy to discuss and take things further yeah thank you sanjay i think it was uh, all cases had uh, some learning point maybe it's related to morphology or maybe it's related to ihc so we have few quest uh, only one question so the papillary carcinoma of uh, retrosternal space which you showed uh, they are asking whether it was a tall cell variant or it was a conventional papillary carcinoma it was conventional for tall cell the morphological features are slightly more worrying this is a conventional papillary carcinoma okay and probably for last case they were saying whether it is angiosarcoma or not the paraganglioma one the difference yes yeah yeah absolutely so when 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 i saw that on initial morphology i did keep that although the although morphological features were not typical there were no necrosis no mitoses but that's a good differential that's why i did a 31 and 34 and it highlighted the background vessels but the tumor cells themselves were negative but that's a good differential to consider in a in a case like that and then the new endocrine markers basically clinch it yeah so i don't see more questions i just wanted to ask you your experience about small cell carcinoma of the mediastinum especially when it is female and non smoker and you don't have any lesion in the lung uh that's a difficult one dr aman i i don't think we uh, i i i i must be honest here i don't think i have seen a small cell in a non non smoker at all here 
Yeah, I don't know. We are seeing, I mean, few, uh, not very, I mean, maybe one or two. So, really? the females, these are non-smokers and then they have done a mediastinal biopsy and we say small cell carcinoma, then they are not agreeing to it because... Uh, oh my goodness, yeah. really? Yeah. I don't know what to do about that. I think probably they are treating these patients as small cell carcinomas with the lung protocol. Do, yeah. do they have the other clinical features like a, a lot of mediastinal disease? Everything else matches a small cell of a smoker? Yes, exactly. Even the morphology and the mediastinal mass, but no primary in the lung. It's known that you may not find a primary even on yeah. the best of uh, uh, radiological yeah. images, but still... Yeah, that is known. No, I, I, I must, uh, uh, I must uh, confess that no, non-smoker and uh, no, 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 I, I have no experience at all. Okay. So, there's one more question. When to suspect nut carcinoma on core biopsy? Should we do nut IHC on every patient, young patient with epithelial malignancy? No, I don't think so. Uh, but, uh, again, with nut carcinomas, how commonly are we seeing nut carcinomas? I, I appreciate the question. Do you see many? Dr. No, Aman? I have not seen any, but I mean, yeah. yeah. So I think if you see undifferentiated cells in a background and in uh, just abrupt, uh, well-differentiated squamous, eddies-like areas, so in those cases, you should suspect nut carcinoma. I mean, yeah, on biopsy, no. I'm sure it will be difficult, but if you have a bigger biopsy, then these are the features uh, based on which you should do nut IHC. Yeah. Okay, so hmm. uh, Dr. Nadi, uh, I think uh, these were the questions and Dr. Sanjay has done a wonderful job. Even I... It's very kind. Thought, I'm no, sure thank you. Good. Thank you, Dr. Aman. You have moderated it very well. So, thank you. And uh, your experience, I mean, you are in PGI, you are seeing so much more than what we see here. So, minor isolated examples, but you are seeing a lot more than we are seeing. It's always a good to exchange, you know, academic discussions like this. Yes. No, it's a, it's a privilege. Uh, yes, Dr. Nadim, yes. No, thank you so much. Uh, we, are, we are soon going to have Dr. Aman speaking on lymphomas so we will get ah, okay. her experience as well yeah she's T cell lymphomas, yes, it's a difficult job, but T uh, cell, oh, wow. <laughs> so, uh, Dr. San Sanjay, yeah. thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you, thank you for one giving me the tell you One thing I can tell you for sure that your your leaving PGI has been a big loss to PGI. Oh, sir. <laughs> I wish you were there to teach all the residents who came after you. What a teacher oh. you are. Wonderful. That's and very like, kind. I'm like, humbled. <laughs> sir, like I told you last time, aap dil se padate ho, dil se. Matlab, sir, itna time, yes. you take out so much time and I, I know how much effort you have made in trying to prepare this lecture. I mean, uh, I know that very well. So, you can imagine how much time you have spent the amount of dedication and that love to teach the residents of our country it's 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 a it's a commendable job and i can I, I can't thank you any less my god wonderful job excellent thank you sir thank you dr I, I wish we have, we have you back in the country to teach our people here <laughs> once you are done with with, <laughs> with with your uk thing please come back <laughs> that's wonderful. very kind i'm a very to very excellent teacher wonderful Kya padhate hai, oh my god. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Nadim. That's very kind of you. And so nice of you to take out time from such a busy schedule, so much of time difference. You know, going to your offices on Saturdays, which are off days, you know, and then studying and then preparing and then and then presenting from there, you know, cutting off on your, you know, weekends. My god, thank you so much, Dr. Sanjay. Thank Jitna you. Thank you, Dr. Nadim. Come I think I, I am I am very humbled. Uh, it's very kind very of you and it's been, uh, been it's three, been a pleasure. Three lectures and all these three lectures have been remarkably excellent, the amount of effort. And I would like to thank Dr. Aman. I am aware PGI may be kitna pressure. Hai. In spite of that, the moment I, I approached her, very second she said, yes, I'll be more than happy to do. So nice of you, Dr. Aman, to yes. consent to that. It's, a, it's an honor to have you here. 
and uh, it's it's a real honor for this entire platform to have you here to to moderate and subsequently i you will be here to teach us also it will be an it will be a very nice experience for everybody to learn from you t cell lymphoma is not an easy subject it's a very vast subject and uh, it's it's changing and then we have so many people who are thanking everybody dr ocean saini says thank you sir right thank you yes, thank you everybody thank you aman bhai i think thank you would you, thank you, dr. Would you like to say your last words before we close Uh, so it was wonderful i think uh, it's a wonderful job you are doing organizing all these teaching sessions and it was wonderful connecting with sanjay and listening to him as always you know so dr nadeem's invitation is open more frequent visits to india or maybe online <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that's I'll very kind catch of him maybe Thank after you. two months after two months i'll catch him again please after okay. padha thank you bhaiya <laughs> So thank, nice you you. Nice you. thank you very much thank you dr uh, we have dr indranil chakravarti from from calcutta north uh, north bengal he's saying thanks a lot dr sanjay sir oh that's very kind thank you thank uh, you dr nice indranil of him. so nice of uh, him and uh, so nice for everybody who has joined in here and uh, thank you dr aman for for consenting to uh, to moderate thank you everybody god bless you take care good night Thank, Thank you. you very much Bye -bye. sir good night bye 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 bye, bye. bye.